Welcome to The Cultured Commuter. Culture in Context. I'm John Church. And I'm Catherine Moran. In this episode, we visit the New York residents of Alva and William K. Vanderbilt at 660 Fifth Avenue. The first chateau-esque style residence in the United States, it would spur an unprecedented building boom and come to define American luxury and the look of America's Gilded Age. Built in 1882 as a palace meant to evoke the power of a centuries-old castle, 665th lasted less than 50 years, being demolished in 1926. And although the landmark has vanished, fascination with the Gilded Age and the people who defined it still sparkle. Once upon a time, a French castle appeared in New York and changed the face of the city. It was the brainchild of newly minted society figure Alva Vanderbilt and her Parisian-trained architect Richard Morris Hunt. Sighted at 665th Avenue, its towers and turrets soared above its modest brownstone neighbors. And when the doors opened to the glittering world of gilded New York, nothing would ever be the same. Socially or architecturally. 665th was truly a revolutionary American architectural form, and its construction, unbeknownst to Alva and Hunt, signaled the end of the Victorian age in New York. The cluttered parlors and prudish temperaments of Knickerbocker, New York, seemingly dissolved overnight, giving way to the flash and dazzle of a new age. It seems the boundless fortunes of American industrialists were matched only by their insatiable desire to buy history, acquiring countless European treasures for their shiny new mansions. Yet, the characteristic trappings associated with the Gilded Age were not a foregone conclusion. How did the Murray Hill Brownstone give way to the Fifth Avenue Chateau? And the reserved subscription dinner party give way to million dollar parties? There's certainly more to the story than a group of thoughtless people flaunting unbounded wealth in a great race of consumption and brazen self-interest. Standing at the epicenter of change were socialite Alva Vanderbilt and her architect, Richard Morris Hunt, who were certainly more than mere cultural tourists. They were like-minded esthetes, eager to advance themselves in New York society, albeit for different ends. Hunt had the talent and training to far surpass the contemporary forms of American architecture, but needed an ambitious and cultivated client with the capital to fund his vision. Alva, who looked to the Medici for inspiration, wanted to advance her social standing and believed she could transform the reputation and public image of the Vanderbilt family through art and architecture. Alva and Hunt personified a new cosmopolitanism, which was not yet fully realized by their American contemporaries. Hunt spent his youth abroad. He was the first American accepted to the prestigious Le Col des Beaux-Arts in Paris. Like Hunt, Alva spent several years as a young girl living in Paris. Both traveled extensively, not only through Europe, but further afield to remote locales like Egypt. This worldly sophistication in both architect and patron was embodied by 665th Avenue, and it signaled a sharp break with the rigidity of old New York society defined by the brownstone. Constructed between 1878 and 1882, 665th represents an American renaissance of classical architecture and expresses the highest levels of discernment and refinement. Hunt's first-hand knowledge of historic ornament and architectural forms played out in all of his chateau and made it seem like an exotic hothouse flower among a sea of daisies. So 665th shone not only in its own right, but in comparison to contemporary New York domestic architecture. Well-traveled and fashionable New Yorkers easily drew connections between the architecture they had seen in Europe and what they saw and lived in at home. For instance, the Mrs. Astor, the reigning queen of New York society, had a Parisian apartment where she spent five months every year. She spoke French fluently, bought her clothes at Worth, and was an intimate of the best social sets in Paris. In contrast, She had no grand home in New York, but resided instead in a staid Murray Hill brownstone. The newly married Alva would not simply emulate the reigning queen of New York. She would outbuild and outstyle her with a new chateau. Set back from the street, 665th rose to an elegant four stories, terminating in a steeply hipped roof line, accentuated with blue slates and punctuated by a decorative copper cresting and finials, which sparkled and shone high above the city streets. 
The facade of 665th was faced with Indiana limestone, which soon became the most popular building material in the city, and featured a deeply recessed door bordered by pilasters and crowned with a balcony. Alva maintained that 665th was the first important house in New York which did not have a brownstone front with a high stoop. In contrast, it offered a magnificent backdrop to the spectacle of arriving guests. The most dazzling feature of the facade was a slim tower known as a tourelle. Carved with a fleur-de-lis pattern, an ancient symbol of the French monarchy, this feature extended the silhouette of 665th above neighboring rooftops to triumphantly pierce the New York City skyline. And within a decade, Fifth Avenue would be lined with palaces such as this. Inside, the entry opened to a main hall featuring a seven-foot dado, massive fireplace, and grand stair of imported French con limestone. Executing the carving in the entryway alone took the army of imported Italian craftsmen two years to complete. The resulting high-paneled, broad-beamed ceiling offered a decorative canopy under which the guests were received. The dining room featured oak paneling in the French Renaissance style of Henry II, expertly finished by leading American furniture makers Herder Brothers. There were also double fireplaces of red sandstone and a stained glass window that depicted the meeting of Francois I and Henry VIII at the Field of the Cloth of Gold. Against this backdrop, Alva hosted concerts, at which she claims to have launched the career of the German composer and longtime conductor of the New York Symphony, Walter Damrosch. To dazzle her guests and bring to mind ancient European houses, which had evolved over generations, the room played host to two important 18th century masterpieces. The first, a portrait of Mrs. John Eliot by Thomas Gainsborough, and the second, a portrait of Captain George Kussmacher by Sir Joshua Reynolds, both of which now reside in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. The crown jewel of the first floor was the 18th century French-inspired drawing room, which evoked the mystique of famed French queen Marie Antoinette, both in spirit and in reality. The interior finishes were executed by Jules Allard and Sons of Paris. The gold and white boiserie combined Louis XV and Regent's style architectural motifs, and when completed, was the first French-styled paneled room in the United States. It visually linked the Vanderbilt with the glory and tradition of the French court. In addition, the ceiling was painted in France by Paul Baudry, who notably created the ceiling for the greatest architectural triumph of Napoleon III's Second Empire, Charles Garnier's Paris Opera House. The salon also featured two tapestries by Francois Boucher, who is the favorite painter of Madame de Pompadour, the fabled mistress of King Louis XV. If links between Alva Vanderbilt and the French court are strengthened by the architectural associations of the room and the Boucher tapestries, Alva's place as the modern American queen was solidified by the inclusion of two black and gold Japanese lacquered pieces by Jean-Henri Riesner, commissioned for Marie Antoinette. Here, Alva's acquisition of objects owned by European royalty, most importantly Marie Antoinette, assume a ritual or idolatry aspect. In gaining control and ownership over objects with royal provenance, Alva becomes the queen by proxy. Reisner's 1783 drop front secretary stood in Marie Antoinette's private apartment at the Chateau of saint Cloud and prominently features her initials three times in the gilt bronze frieze under the marble top. The second piece is a 1783 commode commissioned to stand in the Queen's grand cabinet interior at Versailles. It housed a collection of Japanese lacquer boxes inherited from the Queen's mother, Empress Maria Theresa of Austria. The sumptuous ornament on the secretary epitomized the refined taste of the French Queen. It features beautifully chased gilded bronze flowers, fruit, wheat, and symbols of royal abundance, pouring forth from cornucopia mounts along the lower edge. Alva mistakenly related the origins of the Riesner pieces in her memoir as presented by the city of Paris to Louis, the Dauphin of France, when he brought Marie Antoinette there as a bride. She also noted in her memoir that the great English antique dealer, Sir Joseph Duveen, considered the cabinet and secretary far beyond any others of that period in existence. Although her provenance is inaccurate, her story and the comment from Duveen lend a mystique to the pieces and add to the power of their new owner. Alva's rarefied aesthetic sense and brazen individuality 
partnered with Hunt's modern interpretation of European-inspired architecture to find the American landscape of luxury. And consecrated her as a tastemaker and a queen of New York society. With her own new chateau designed by Hunt, it seemed that even Mrs. Astor agreed. Thank you for joining us. Please visit theculturedcommuter.com to join our cultured community, check out our social media, and subscribe to our podcasts and webisodes. Please tune in next time for more Culture in Context. The music in this podcast is an excerpt from L'Etoile Danse and is provided courtesy of Maidan.